Let's pray. Loving Lord, help us to follow your example on earth, that we may come with all the saints to be in your presence in heaven. Here on earth that we may sing your praise, there in heaven that we may sing it even more, and better still. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I have an absolutely impossible task because I have to preach a sermon that's in two parts. One to do with all saints, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and one to reflect the gospel. Absolutely impossible, you will say. Well, maybe I need the help of Saint Rita who was the patron saint of the impossible and of impossible feats. Or maybe better still, Catherine of Alexandria, who is the patron saint of preachers. But I suspect that she's probably a little bit too busy because she's actually the patron saint of 33 different causes. <coughs> so, failing that, who else can I choose? I could go for Julian, but I'm not terribly sure about him. He fulfills what it was that Oscar Wilde said, which is, the only difference between saints and sinners is that saints have a past and sinners have a future. <coughs> well, let's see if that's true in the case of Julian. Yes, it is, because actually, accidentally, in a case of mistaken identity, he managed to murder both his parents. He decided as a result of that that he really ought to try to atone for this, so he went with his wife to Rome and became known as the Great Hospitaller, from which we get the name Hospital and Hospitality and Hospice. And so, indeed, he became eventually a saint. Okay, well, maybe instead I ought to turn to Saint Isidore. Maybe Saint Isidore will help a 6th and 7th century Archbishop in Seville. He is, now wait for it, the patron saint of what? Anybody know? The internet. <laughs> now you may think, well, how on earth is that so? Well, he was declared a saint of the internet and patron saint of the internet and of computers, incidentally, so if ever you're stuck, just call to mind Saint Isidore, by John Paul II great Pope. And he argued that actually in his day Isidore had been a collector of knowledge, standing against lack of knowledge. He created really the first ever encyclopedia, and so therefore indeed was the right person to be the patron saint of the internet. But failing that, I suppose I could, in the end, go to the favourite saint of one of the bishops with whom I served, a lovely bishop called Bishop Richard Lewis, and he loved quoting her, mainly because of her title. And her title, <coughs> Christina the Astonishing. <laughs> Why is Christina astonishing? Because actually, at the age of 20 or thereabouts, she was being a pastor to various herds, and she suffered a seizure and died they decided that they would have a funeral service for her. At which point, in the middle of the coffin, she actually sat up and said, I'm perfectly all right, thank you very much, <laughs> and went on to do various astonishing deeds and died of natural causes at the age of 74. <laughs> so there are all kinds of saints you could call upon, but why is today All Saints Day? Well, originally, the All Saints Day was on the Sunday immediately after Pentecost to join together those disciples who had received the gift of the Holy Spirit and those who were in the process of becoming the first martyrs of the Church. It was moved from that date on November the 1st when a particular bishop, Gregory III, decided that he would consecrate a chapel in Rome to all saints, mainly because 
was, so many people were being declared saints that actually some of them would not get in on one of the 365 days, or 366 in a leap year, because there were by then about 10,000. <laughs> now therefore, for those who didn't have their own particular day, and so that they didn't feel left out, it was declared that there should be an All Saints Day, and then they'd be perfectly okay, and it's All Saints and Martyrs. And that chapel still stands in Rome, and you can go and see it, it's the Pantheon. Well, okay, well, what exactly do saints do? I'm going to refer to a treatise that came from the middle of the Tudor period, in other words, in the 16th century, and a reading from somebody called Hugh Latimer. If you don't know anything about Hugh Latimer, I'll tell you a little bit more. Or you could just simply go to, uh, with St. Isidore's help, to the internet and find out. Hugh Latimer said this, as touching the saints in heaven, they be not our mediators by way of redemption, for so Christ alone is our mediator, and theirs both. So that the blood of martyrs hath nothing to do by way of redemption. The blood of Christ is enough for a thousand worlds. But by way of intercession, so saints in heaven may be mediators and pray for us, as I think they do, when we call not upon them, for they be charitable and need no spurs. I'll come back to Hugh Latimer perhaps at the end, but we ought to look at the Gospel. The problem with the Gospel readings that we have, and particularly from John's Gospel in chapter 11, is that it doesn't tell you the whole story. It's just a tiny, tiny fragment to whet your appetite. So let me tell you what happened before and a little bit of what happened afterwards. Jesus and the disciples were some distance away when he received news that his great friend Lazarus from Bethany was sick. And the news was conveyed on behalf of Mary and of Martha. Mary was mentioned first in that instance. You'll see that it's actually reversed a little bit later on. But he said that actually the illness from which Lazarus was suffering would not lead to death, but would be for the glory of God. His disciples no doubt scratched their heads and wondered what this meant, particularly since he didn't seem to be in any hurry to go. He delayed for another two days, by which time, almost certainly, if Lazarus was going to worsen, he would have done so. Well, eventually Jesus said, come on, let's go then to Judea. And so they set off, despite the reservations that the disciples then had, because Jesus had recently been stoned by some of the religious authorities and the crowds, and it would be quite dangerous to go back to Jerusalem. But nevertheless, he set off, and Thomas, who gets a very bad press in other ways, actually was one of those who said with great courage, Come on, let's go with him, and that we may die with him. So if that's what it cost, that's what they were going to do. On the way there, just coming from Jericho towards Jerusalem, Jesus was met by Martha just outside the village, which itself is about two miles, just under two miles, outside Jerusalem. And Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. For indeed he had. And Jesus discovered that he'd been dead for four days, the significance of which I'll talk about in just a moment. And Martha said, But even now I know that God will do for you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said, well, your brother will rise again. Yes, I know that he'll rise again at the last day. But actually, Jesus meant more than that. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God, the Messiah, who is coming into the world. She goes back and she says to Mary that she has met Jesus 
And she says it privately, so that Mary too is going to have a quiet moment with Jesus. But actually those who are there, weeping with her and mourning with her for the death of Lazarus, discover that she's got up and they decide to follow her. And so they too meet Jesus. She says the same thing that Martha has said. No doubt the two of them have said that to each other. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus, very quietly, begins to weep. See how much he loved him, say those who are gathered round. And eventually, Jesus goes to the tomb, and the tomb is sealed with a stone. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yes, it does. And there's more that will sound familiar as well. Remember that Jesus rose on the third day. The silence of the day said that if somebody had been dead for three days, their body would begin to decay. But Lazarus had been dead for four days. He was dead indeed, and there was absolutely no doubt about it. He'd been wrapped in the clothes that are the burial clothes. He'd been placed in the tomb. The tomb itself had been sealed with a stone. Jesus says to Martha, okay, roll away the stone. But he's been dead for four days. It'll be a terrible stench. She's very practical, is Martha. She knows what will happen if they roll the stone away. But they do roll the stone away. And Jesus calls to Lazarus, having first prayed. And it's the only time that we actually hear Jesus in public prayer before a miracle happens. And he says to God his Father, I know that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of those who are around, so that they can witness effectively what's about to happen. And then he calls very loudly to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. Well, of course, that should be impossible. But remember, Christina, the astonishing. This is even more astonishing. Lazarus does come out. What he feels has happened during this time is not actually recorded. But Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. Those words are very significant. Unbind him. When Jesus at the resurrection is not found in the tomb, not only is the body not there, but the grave clothes are wrapped up neatly in a place by themselves. Here, Lazarus wears the grave clothes still. It's a sign that he will die again. But for the moment, to show the power and the glory of God, he is brought back to life. It isn't that he fainted. He's been dead for four days. It is that God has worked in him that miracle that only God can work and has brought him back to life. It's a sign and a symbol of what will happen for all the saints. That actually, at our last awakening, so to speak, as John Donne put it, we shall be in the presence of God and sing such music as we've never sung before, and see such sights as we have never seen before, and pray such prayers as perhaps we have never seen before. Who are the saints? It's you. You are a saint in training. Or as somebody once put it, we are all sinners in different states of sanctification. We might not be there just yet. But another definition of a saint is that a saint, rather like a stained glass window, is someone through whom the light shines. I think that's a lovely definition. But let me refer you back to Latimer. In that same passage, in that same treatise, Latimer says this about saints. The saints 
were not saints by praying to saints, but by believing in him that made them saints. And as they were saints, so may we be saints only. I'm sure that Hugh Latimer didn't know as he wrote that, that very shortly he was about to become one of the three Oxford martyrs and burnt at the stake. Remember that sometimes following Christ has a high cost indeed. Are you willing to pay that cost if that's what's asked of you? Remember what cost there was to Christ when that was asked of him, who died for the sake of each of us, whether we are worthy of it or not. And he invites us here on earth to join with that great company of saints, living and departed, that we may always love and follow the God who loves us in his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.